The first reading today comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge for the poor and decide with equity for the oppressed of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion will feed together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to all to the peoples, the nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. The second reading today comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his paths straight. Now, John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan were going out to him and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore bear fruit worthy of repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Therefore every tree that does, that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is more powerful than I, and I'm not worthy, worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork in his, is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granar granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. <clears throat> Every Advent, these uh, two scriptures that we've heard today come up to be read. John with his ever so cheery, <laughs> optimistic sermon. And, and Isaiah's prophecy, this prophecy with this beautiful picture of this tiny shoot coming out of this stump, this beautiful image of a fragile but persistent hope. And, and usually when we read this Isaiah passage, we start right off with the shoot. A shoot shall come from the stump of Jesse. Um, however, there are a couple verses that precede this that many biblical scholars think is actually a part of this section and kind of set the scene. The, the two verses that are right before the shoot coming from the stump of Jesse read this way. 
Look, the sovereign, the Lord of hosts, will lop the boughs with terrifying power. The tallest trees will be cut down and the lofty will be brought low. He will hack down the thickets of the forest with an axe and Lebanon with its mighty trees will fall. And then a shoot shall come from the stump of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of its roots. In order for that fragile but persistent shoot to be able to grow, something had to be taken away. Something had to be taken away in order for this new thing to emerge. Boughs had to be lopped off. Lop the boughs. By the way, a word we should work into conversation more frequently is the word lop. Lop the boughs. Hack down the thickets. This is usually left out of Isaiah's prophecy, probably because it doesn't make for a really good Christmas carol text. <laughs> Although, if you thought about it, lop the boughs and hack the thickets, fa la 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 I mean, <laughs> kind of, <laughs> it, all right, maybe not. Boughs being lopped off, thickets being hacked down. This is, in fact, the second time that Isaiah has painted a picture for us of something that needs to go away in order for something new to emerge. Last week, when we read Isaiah's prophecy, it was the swords and the spears that needed to go away so that the plowshares and the pruning hooks could emerge. The things that do harm had to go away so that the things that nourish and bring life could emerge. This week it is these tall thickets of trees that need to go away so that this new branch can begin to grow. The tall and lofty trees that the Lord hacks away allow for a new, fragile, but persistent shoot to come from the stump. How often in order for something new to emerge, something else has to go away. Of course, John knew this as well. Even now, the axe is lying at the root of the trees, he said. If the trees are not producing good fruit, then they are cut down. They are lopped off. They are thrown into the fire. And why? So that good fruit can be produced. So that good fruit, fruit that is worthy of repentance, so that good fruit can emerge. And, and John uses a similar metaphor later in his message. The one who is to come, this one that he is talking about is bringing a winnowing fork. The purpose of which is to separate chaff from wheat. The chaff, the waste needs to go away so that that which is nutritious and life-giving can remain to feed people. Something almost always has to go away in order for something new to emerge. So for Isaiah, what needed to go away was Assyria, the ruthless, brutal, violent regime and threat of Assyria needed to go away so that something new could emerge. And what needed to emerge in the moment was a brand new reign, a reign, a ruler who was connected to the reign of David. Because you see, this shoot isn't coming from nowhere. The shoot is coming from the stump of Jesse. It is significant that the root is Jesse's root because Jesse is the father of David, King David, who was king in Israel during the glory days of the nation. It turns out United Methodist churches aren't the only things that had glory days. You know every United Methodist church has a glory days and it was always 15 to 20 years ago. Isn't it weird how... It's always like, do you remember 15 years ago when, yeah, man, that was glory days. Turns out the nation of Israel had a glory days as well. And it was when King David was on the throne. Now, connecting this emerging realm to David's throne is important because it is a central component in the, in the people's expectation of the Messiah. The one God who is to send is to come from this line of David. So after Assyria clears the thicket, destroying 10 out of the 12 original tribes of the Hebrew people, there is a stump of the nation that is left. And the ruler of the stump of the nation is this guy named Ahaz. King Ahaz 
is the king right now. And you should, t- t- should totally boo when you hear King Ahaz, uh, when you hear his name. The Bible leaves no doubts as to which kings were good and which weren't. It tells us right off the bat, like King Ahaz was not a good king when he is introduced First, uh, second King 16 said, he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord like his ancestor David had done. Again, always comparing to David. David is the standard. David is the measure of comparison here. Ahaz did not do what God wanted him to do. Ahaz brought Canaanite idols into the temple and encouraged worship of Canaanite idols. Ahab, for example, um, revived the practice of human sacrifice in worship, including, uh, as it turns out, his own son. And Ahaz very significantly went to Assyria, went to the superpower of the time, and tried to enter into a relationship with them, motivated by self-preservation. In order to preserve himself and his throne and the nation, he sought aid from Assyria, against the advice of the prophets who encouraged him to seek advice from God. And so Ahaz has left this stump of the nation. And for Isaiah, the shoot that is to come from this stump is almost certainly the next king, Ahaz's son, whose name was Hezekiah. And sure enough, Hezekiah did things differently, took the idols out of the temple, followed the guidance of the spirit rather than self-preservation, and did a whole bunch of things for the nation, including, very significantly, building a wall around an area of the city of Jerusalem that was yet to be walled in, digging a tunnel under the walls of the city to supply water during times of siege. So where Ahaz had destroyed the nation, Hezekiah sought to build it up again. But in order for Hezekiah to do all this, something had to get out of the way, and that was his father. Ahaz had to leave so that Hezekiah could come to power all the time, the cycles of life. Something needs to go so that something new can emerge. And when this new reign emerges, when this new way of being comes to the forefront, Isaiah makes it clear That the decision-making process, the discernment process is going to be very different now. First of all, the new ruler will follow the lead of the Holy Spirit. Not for self-preservation, not looking within, but looking at where the Holy Spirit is going. Following the guidance and counsel of the Spirit, not for self-preservation. Even if it's risky, follow the Spirit. The second thing Isaiah tells us that this new ruler will do is not look on the surface level, not make decisions based on what their eyes and ears perceive, but rather dig deeply to root out injustice and inequity at the deeper levels of the nation and make decisions not for comfort and convenience of the surface level of those in power in particular, but rather make decisions that in fact, that impact deep change, empowering all of the people. And then finally, decisions of this new way of being will be made for the oppressed and for the poor. He will decide, they will decide for the oppressed and for the poor, not for the self, not for the elites, not for the wealthy, but for those who are left aside. That's to be the decision-making process of this new ruler. And Reverend Dr. Casey Sigmund says that when the governor makes decision based on these rules, the wicked will feel as though they have been struck by the governor's decrees, their way of life put to death by their words. Once a ruler comes into power and starts making decisions like this, Isaiah paints us a picture of what the world will look like. It is a picture of predator and prey living side by side with no harm being done. A peaceable kingdom. And who has changed in this picture? Who has changed in order to make a picture like this possible? Or said another way, whose diet has changed? in order to make this picture possible. Isaiah tells us that the bear is now grazing, that the lion is now eating straw. It seems to me that who changed in this picture was the predator. 
That the predator was made to change their ways so that the prey would have the confidence to be able to rest in community together. Isaiah envisions a peace that is simply not possible unless the predator changes. Now to be sure, this is not intended to be an instructional piece on how nature actually works. It's a, it's a spiritual metaphor. If you watch any National Geographic documentary, you will see predators eating prey. And that will always happen. It's like life, you know, circle of life thing. It goes on. However, what Isaiah is trying to do here is to give us a glimpse of that fragile but persistent hope that comes from the peace of God in this peaceable kingdom. And the first step toward that peace is the stopping of harm from happening. The predators must be made to change. In other words, the conditions in the world that allow for evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves have to change in order for something different to emerge. Everyone who is a member of a United Methodist congregation has made a promise to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. And the reason that we have made that promise is so that will get out of the way so that a new kind of way of being can emerge. God's peace and love and grace. It's the same, by the way, in John's message. John came to say, that the kingdom of heaven has come near. <laughs> don't you love? Don't you love John the Baptist? I mean, dude looks exhausted, doesn't he? He's like, I've been telling you guys that the reign of God is on its way for so long. When are you going to finally listen, you brood of vipers? That's his message, right? The kingdom of heaven has come near, but in order for it to merge, something's got to change. Something's got to get out of way. All y'all need to repent need to change and not just repent, but bear fruit that is worthy of repentance. Something about our life together needs to change. And it's not just an under the surface kind of change. There has to be something at the surface, something visible, something tangible. There has to be fruit behind this change, says John. Something has to get out of the way If a new way of being is going to emerge, a few boughs have to get lopped off. A few thickets have to be cleared. If a new branch of fragile but persistent peace will ever hope to be. And that is our Advent question as well. Framing it in terms of this season, what is it that we can clear away so that Christ can be born? What is it? that we can clear away so that Christ, the Prince of Peace, can be born in our midst. You can do this on a number of levels. You can think about this on a number of levels. We can think about this in terms of ministry at the church. One of our most fruitful and vibrant ministries has been our Wednesday evening community meal. And this fall, it has been especially fruitful with 150, 160, sometimes 170 people gathered just across the way in Fellowship Hall, sharing food together, breaking bread together, all ages, across the generations, a true glimpse of community being together. And it's been wonderful. However, about six to eight months ago, we sat down to think about that ministry because the way that we were doing it was unsustainable. It was burning people out. People were exhausted. Participation was low. And so something had to go. And we decided that the entire way that that ministry happened, the Wednesday night dinners, the entire way that that happened just had to go, go away so that something new can emerge. Notice that the ministry is still happening. The people involved with the still ministry are, with the ministry are still involved, but the people involved are breathing a sigh of relief because the new way of doing it is so much better and so much more fruitful. In order to get there, though, an old way had to just, just go away so that a new thing could emerge. So you can do this as a group, looking at as a congregation, but you can also do this as an individual. You can do this yourself in your own discipleship. Everyone who's a member of a church has made a promise to participate in the ministries of the church 
You should have these memorized by now. By your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. So think about the service, the way that you are fulfilling that promise through service. You're serving in some way. It might be helping to lead worship. It might be volunteering at playground. It might be uh, teaching a class or leading a small group. It might be fixing a bike or, or selling a Christmas tree down the street. It might be packing food for kids. There's plenty of options is my point. But you're doing one of those, right? So think about that thing. And in that space, in the space of your particular service, does something need to go away so that something new can emerge? Is it a burden? Is it burning people out? Is it stressful? Is it not as fruitful as it could be? Does a new way of being need to emerge? So what needs to change in your particular service as a disciple of Jesus Christ so that something new can be born? Of course, you can think about this differently as well. Because for some of us, the question needs to be a bit deeper. For some of us, there's, there may be something destructive or, or harmful or exhausting in your life. Something that feels like an obstacle in your relationship with God. Something that feels like it's getting in the way of, of your faith. Something that feels like it's just preventing you from flourishing as God intends you to flourish. It might be some animosity that you bear. It might be some envy, some some bitterness, it might be some unrealistic expectations that are coming from somewhere, it might be some preconceived notions that you're holding on to, I don't know what it is. But those things that that prevent you from flourishing in God's grace are, are predators. They are the predators. And the prey is your spirit. And peace cannot emerge unless the predators are made to change their ways. When the predators stop doing harm, then and only then can the new thing emerge. So think about your own spiritual life. What is it that needs to go away so that you can renew your spirit and find rest in the Lord? The peace that passes understanding. Advent just happens to be the perfect season to do that, by the way. To find that thing in your life that needs to go away so that God's peace can emerge. Because when we're able to do that, oh friends, when we are able to do that, we discover something remarkable and amazing and beautiful. And here we turn back to the words of the prophet Isaiah because in Isaiah's picture, when the change happens, when that predator stops harming the prey, when the obstacle is lopped off, then Isaiah says three things are going to happen. The first thing that's going to happen is that they're going to eat together. Because of course they're going to eat together. We're Methodists. They're going to sit down at a table together. They're going to break bread together. They're going to fellowship in a common meal side by side. They eat together. Predator and prey eat together at table. The second thing they do in Isaiah's vision is they rest. They rest. They lie down together. Anybody feel like you need a little rest about now? They rest, they breathe deeply, clear your mind for once, relax your shoulders for the first time in weeks, just rest. And the third thing that happens in Isaiah's vision of peace is that they play. They play. What's the child doing right next to the the poisonous snake? Playing over the den of the snake. They play. There is joy. There is laughter. There is fun. There is happiness. It's really very simple. Peace is a chance to rest, to play, to break bread together in community. I'm really starting to wonder if maybe peace is such an elusive thing that we're ever going to find it again. Or maybe it's just that we're overcomplicating things so much that we don't recognize it when it's all around us. So many people in these past few months have made a point to come up to me and say, Andy, I'm just, 
I'm overwhelmed. I'm tired. I'm worn out. I just, everything, everything's harder than it needs to be. Everything is heavier to carry than it used to be. It feels like, friends, we are pushing our way through this overgrown thicket where we can't see more than a step or two ahead of us. The branches are grabbing at us on the way as we push by them. And we only get these glimpses of peace here and there, but they are fleeting and they are few and they are far between. Something needs to go away so that something new can emerge. John's call for repentance is as loud as it ever has been. We need to lop off some some boughs. We need to hack away some thickets, simplify to make room. And when we make that room, as that change happens, as the harm ceases, and as Christ arrives, may we together discover the fragile but persistent hope of God's peace contained in the simple joys of breaking bread together, playing, and resting in the Lord. Holy Spirit, grant us peace. Holy Spirit, come. Move those things out of the way that need to move so that we might discover the simple, beautiful hope of your peace. To you, holy God, In the name of Jesus, our Savior, and in the presence and peace of your Spirit. Amen.